I don't do that very often. All right, so don't panic. I probably won't do it to you, but I can get away with it with her. All right. Uh, but anyway, financial peace would be great for you to take. All right, and I'd love to have you do that September, uh, September the 16th. That will kick off today. We have almost 85 kids heading to camp. All right, we have 32 fourth, fifth, and sixth graders leaving today for camp. And we have 51 high school students leave. Actually, we have almost 100 by the time you count counselors that are heading to camp today. Guess who gets to be one of the high school counselors this week? You. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done that in 22 years, John. 22 years the last time I was a high school counselor. Let me explain the reason for that. Uh, Pastor Chris is... Uh, he is on a two two week personal leave. All right, there's some things came up. He needed a couple of weeks off. It just happened to fall right before camp. So you need to be praying uh, for him. All right, uh, and be praying for us as we go to camp this week. All right. So uh, most of those high school kids are going to be trying to get out of here by about 11:30, and uh, I'll be joining them up the hill as soon as the last service is over. So anyway, we're very very excited to have that many kids going to camp this week. Uh, next Sunday, really special Sunday for us, all right? So get the word out to those who've maybe been kind of slumping during the summer, all right? Been on vacations, and that's good. But if everybody gets back for Sunday, it'd be great. The Actis family are going to be home from Uganda, Africa. Matt and Shelley and the girls, part of our own church family. Uh, they've been to Columbia for four years, planted a church there that's still going strong. They've now served the last two and a half years in Uganda, Africa. Uh, doing some great work there. They're going to, all next Sunday, it's going to be about them. They'll be in each of our worship services. Then in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock, you don't have to come for all three hours. You can just come for a hour, either 2, 3, or 4, and experience what they're calling village encounter. And uh, we're touching base with them this week to find out because we don't really want it to be outside because of the heat of what it's projected to be, so we're not sure yet what rooms it's going to be in, but you can come for an hour or two, three, or four, you'll get to experience what village life is sort of like, all right, in various ways, and then they will have the entire evening service at five o'clock, and it will probably be in the sanctuary, because there might be more of you that we can hold in the bridge. So uh, but we're excited to have the Actus family home with us and to hear what God has been doing with them over in Uganda. Our small group or, uh, is going to be sponsoring a night on August the 17th. It's a Friday night. Doors will open at 6.30. The movie will start at 7 o'clock. They're going to be featuring the movie, I Can Only Imagine. It was just in the theaters about four months ago. We're going to be showing it here, and uh, they're going to have concessions, popcorn, beverages, that kind of stuff for us to enjoy that evening as well. Uh, so please take note of that and get it on your calendar. All right? Um, I kind of worked this into the sermon, but since the rights are sitting right here, rights, would you stand up? All right, uh, applaud for them, then I'll tell you why. And it's not because they've been married 70 years, all right, 72 years, all right, and has nothing to do with that. It has to do with their offsprings, all right, their grandson, all right, who swam at Clovis West, and then I think he went on at Arizona. And uh, now he was picked up uh, this year by a swim team organization for him to compete at the U.S. Nationals, which is a precursor to the, the next Olympics. He competed this past week in the 200 fly. He was in seventh place at the last turn. And he won first place. His birthday, his 100th birthday, 
is November the 7th. The leadership of CBMC International, which is Christian Businessmen's Committee, last year asked all of their local and regional teams to plan a 100th birthday celebration for Billy Gray. Many of those celebrations have been canceled, but not the one in Fresno. The team here in the committee that uh, I was invited to be a part of for this event has continued to meet. We just met again this past Friday. We nailed down the final plans for that 100th birthday celebration. So we are going to be meeting at Tornino's on November the 7th. I believe that is a Wednesday. November the 7th, a Wednesday. And that day is going to be a life celebrated and a legacy perpetuated. <clears throat> Billy Graham said a few years ago that he thought the greatest evangelist alive today was Greg Laurie. Some of you have been with Greg Laurie on the radio, Harvest Festivals. He is the one who currently is doing citywide, statewide outreach events reaches thousands every time he goes out. Well, we have the opportunity to have Greg Laurie come and be the speaker at the luncheon for Billy Graham's 100th anniversary yeah. celebration. Yeah. Yeah. And what Greg Laurie has been challenged to do is to challenge all of us who are present to keep the legacy of Billy Graham going. What is Billy Graham's legacy? If I want to guess, winning souls. Evangelism, that keep sharing your faith of Jesus Christ to others. And so that will be the challenge. Torninos, a single lunch for the 100th anniversary celebration of Billy Graham. It's going to be $25 for a ticket. I think it's going to be sold out almost within a day once the tickets go on the market. So I'm asking you, how many of you would like to go with me to that event at $25 a person? Raise your hand. If it's an 8 o'clock service, I'm not collecting money today, but I need to know how many tables to reserve. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, eight, eight, nine, twenty, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four, three, five, three, six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Perfect. All right. I'll be sitting inside a yes. It's a lunch. It's a lunch time. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be uh, twelve to two or eleven thirty to one thirty. Can't remember since Friday. <laughs> but we'll get it all nailed down, I'll pass the thing around. I've already reserved five tables for us. So between eight o'clock and nine fifteen, we have already exceeded three tables. Okay, so uh, we're 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 gonna let's go. Now there's one other thing I wanna let you know about. This is actually more for fun than anybody else's next one. Michael Jr. is coming to town. Michael Jr. is going to be the keynote speaker at the Youth for Christ Dessert, and that is October the 18th, okay? Uh, that will be an evening dessert. So I'll be sending a sign-up sheet around pretty soon also on that if you would like to attend the YFC Dessert here, Michael Jr. He's one of the funniest guys who knows Jesus that you will ever, ever hear. All right, let's get to uh, prayer requests. Uh, our drummers, who's playing drums today? John, where are you, John? Is he out back? All right. He's not having a cigarette. Uh, no, no. Just kidding, John. Just kidding, John. There he is. Uh, John's wife uh, reached out to Shelly this morning and she had a very special request. Uh, her boss's husband, so stay with me on this. Her boss's husband was one of the five that was killed in an automobile crash yesterday coming back from a golf tournament over in Reno, Las Vegas. Reno, coming back from Las Vegas. So we just, I, I don't have a last name on the family, but if you would just remember, God knows who we're talking about. What a huge tragedy. It's good. Jennifer, welcome back. We had your husband stand and wait. Say anything. Yeah, all right. But uh, <laughs> Jennifer's aunt and uncle in Reading lost their home in a matter of minutes in the fire up at Reading. They had just a few minutes to get in their car and get out of the neighborhood, and their entire home. Uh, is gone. So please be remembering to pray for all of those up in that area going through all of this right now. Uh, Lydia Bendowski's mom uh, has got some serious health issues. Please be remembering to pray for her. Frank Hicks is struggling. Uh, they've had to move him to uh, Genesis, all right? And uh, he is struggling right now. Roger Logan, it's good to see him here. He had carpal tunnel surgery this week, so glad he is up and out. Elaine Pratt, Pratt had a heart valve replaced. And uh, there have been some complications after that. She's still in ICU, so we appreciate you remembering to, uh, to pray for her. 
it's good to have Greg and Shelly back from their trip to Washington. Um, they got up there, we've been praying for his son, Jason, 38 years old, on life support. Tuesday, the decision was made to remove him from life support, and instantly he went to be with Jesus. And so, uh, please be praying for them. Uh, services are being planned for down here in a few weeks, but just be praying for them this week. And uh, I know they would appreciate that so much. Uh, one last thing. These are the kind of cards pastors love to get. But it's, and the reason is because it's about all of you. All right, so let me, let me read it to you. Came after church last Sunday. Dear Pastor Roland, I was a first-time visitor at New Hope this morning. I attended the 915 service. I want to let you know how much I appreciated the message. I know you said it wasn't what you planned to speak about, but I'm very happy the Holy Spirit reminded you of that radio slogan, Fear is Not a Strategy because it did result in a wonderful lesson for me. You also said you hoped that the uh, repeat of some stuff out of the 2011 sermon would be speak to someone. I think it spoke to everyone. Your church and your congregation seem to be so very nice. Now I hope it moves beyond seem to reality. All right, <laughs> she needs to know you better, all right? But you know, it seems to be nice. Um, <laughs> I was not overwhelmed by people asking me a lot of questions. So thank you for not being overly nosy. <laughs> she said, I appreciate that. I did meet the nicest woman, and I don't know, Lori Poole, are you in this service? Lori, are you here? Yeah. Oh, there you are, right there. Okay. She loves sitting near you. Okay, listen to what she said. I may not be spelling her name correctly, but she spoke to me, welcomed me, and invited me back. She said she was fairly new as well and understood what it was like to visit for the first time. She was perfect. Thank you for not saying to her, you're in my seat. <laughs> Just a reminder to y'all, none of you own the seat you're in. Just a reminder. And then I love it. Oh, and the two gentlemen who were directing cars in the parking lot, they were funny and kind. So guys, it starts in the parking lot. All right? It starts in the parking lot. And she even called them gentlemen. Roger, did you notice that? Gentlemen. Funny and it was a wonderful experience. I look forward to attending again. Isn't that a great card? With that said, with that said I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. Well, we have our morning tithes and offering. During our offering, I want to direct your attention to the screen. Uh, we have a special video about safe families. And as soon as that video is over, Mark is going to come forward and introduce a very special guest we have with us today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life that we get to share with you. Thank you for your sufficiency. That you are prepared to meet every need that we encounter. You are prepared to supply to us every demand that you place in our life. You are prepared to be the dynamic of that demand. Father, the Christian life from beginning to end is about our trust, confidence, and dependence upon your Son, the Lord Jesus. This is not about what we can do for you, but this Christian life is what we will allow you to do in us, for us, and then through us to share the love of Christ with others. Thank you for the opportunities to be able to do that. Help us in growing major, Father, to decrease our own desires, passions, and wills and submit to your leadership so that our lives are united with your passion and with your will. We trust you with all the needs that we've already talked about here today as well as those needs that may be very personal and private and yet you know intimately about them. We have great confidence in your sufficiency in each and every one of those. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thank you. And for our guests who will challenge us with a, an opportunity of ministry and outreach beyond our own walls, I trust we'll be attentive to your leadership in our lives and how we can engage in making a caring community for others. For the privilege of giving, we say thanks. We commit it all to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, there are times in life that uh, it becomes overwhelming. And sometimes it's overwhelming because of tough stuff in life. Unfortunate circumstances, like a car wreck that takes five lives. Like a firestorm that consumes hundreds of homes. 
we are overwhelmed. And then there are times in our lives in which we are overwhelmed by that which is good. The grace and the goodness of God and the circumstances in our life. I look back over this past week and they're, they're, uh, this last week is it's, it's a good week for me in a lot of ways. There are tough times, but then, this past week, uh, both of my sons became a year older. <laughs> they're middle aged now. <laughs> 35 and 37. And um, um, our grandson is in the toddler class for the first time today. All right? I think his dad's checking on him. All right, he's he's okay. When I went over there, he said, Hi, Grandpa, leave. <laughs> he, was, he was putting a truck in the microwave. He was going to make it. My, our, our daughter-in-law, uh, in, in two weeks, I'm going to be a grandpa again, all right? So, yeah, she goes rushing out of here. Uh, think nothing of it, just get the mop, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, really excited. Uh, oh, she got me. She got me. Oh. That was good. That was good. Uh, and, and then, guys, uh, if, if you're busy first time today, we're in the middle of a series uh, called uh, What's Up With Heaven. Um, for the first couple of weeks, uh, we just kind of touched on the best parts of heaven and asked for questions. What are things you've always wanted to know about heaven? What are your confusions about heaven? And we, we're doing our best just to work through all those questions and confusions and uncertainties because, uh, let, let's be honest, if we go to heaven, we're going to spend more time there than we will here. Okay, this is temporary. Uh, I know Dad's beginning to wonder if it's temporary or not. Okay, uh, you've been at it 93 years now, and uh, but 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 there will be much much longer than here, and so it'd be great to know about where we're going. We want to create more excitement, just as 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 Laura Lee and Steve are excited about going to Cambria. They know a lot about Cambria because. He's done intro work in a church over there. They vacation there a lot. So it gives them great excitement because they know a lot about where they're going. And we want that same thing to be true about us going to heaven. I love Billy Graham's quote of, you know, somebody tells you I'm dead, don't you believe them? I'm more alive than I've ever been before. And so today what we're going to look at is the question, and many of you sent this one in, is do people in heaven know what's happening on earth? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Now, there are some of the questions that I cannot answer definitively. There are some things in the Bible you can answer about, and I can say this is definitely what the Bible says. If you ask me if it's ever okay to kill somebody, murder, I'm going to tell you no. Okay, and I can say that with great authority. If you ever ask me as an alright, if I fool around on my marriage, I'm going to be able to tell you no. Alright, it is not right to do that. The Bible is very, very specific about that. Uh, if you ask me, are we supposed to take care of widows and orphans? Yes. I'm going to tell you in no uncertain terms. The answer is yes, we are to do that. Those are mandates that are very specific. There's no ambiguity in the direction of that. If some of the things about heaven that we can pull principles from, and we can make best judgments from, and this is one of those questions, all right, that we're going to walk through today. There was a 95-year-old woman who was living in a assisted living facility. And uh, a friend of hers from the church that she attended came to see how she was doing. And when she got there, she said, hey, how are you feeling? And the 95-year-old said, I am just worried, sick. And her guest said, well, what, what, why? what are you worried about? Are they not taking care of you here? And she said, oh, no, they're taking great care of you. I love it. She said, well, are, are you in great pain? And she said, I've never had a pain in my life. Well, the guest was a little confused. She said, then what seems to be the problem? The lady then explained her major worry. She said, every close friend I have ever had has already died and gone to heaven. And I'm afraid they're all wondering which way I went. <laughs> well, don't worry. I really do believe the saints in heaven are aware of God's activity on earth, and it's going to be okay. Imagine with me for just a moment that you're dead. 
You have now arrived at the entrance to heaven. Peter is standing there and he greets you and he asks for your name. And, oh yeah, there you are. Everything's in order, so he welcomes you in. He gives you a big smile as he escorts you to your room at the Father's house. He hands you a package. There's a beautiful robe. There's a golden crown. And then he gives you a theater ticket. Now, the robe and crown aren't a big surprise to you. You remember reading something about that somewhere in the Bible. But, but a ticket to the movies, that was unexpected. And so you ask Peter, hey, hey Pete, what's this ticket for? And he says, oh, there's a movie. Tonight we're having a double feature. The first one stars your friend who was with you when you both were killed in that tragic accident. The first feature is a horror film because your friend did not make it here. They're in hell. However, the second movie is about your life. It stars you with a supporting cast that includes your spouse, your children, dozens of friends and acquaintances, and the climactic scene is your memorial service. It's a tearjerker. But, but I don't want to spoil it for you. I think you're going to really enjoy the show. Before you have a chance to respond, Peter says, oh, 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 here we are. Here's your key. Get some rest. Be sure you get to the theater or it's going to be a sellout. All of heaven will be in attendance. And with that, Peter smiles, turns into sandals, and walks away. Nothing that I just described to you is explained in the Bible like that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure tickets are not going to be handed out for a movie depicting any one of our lives. And I don't think there will be any movies starring those who didn't make it to heaven. <clears throat> But I have discovered a lot of people wonder whether the residents of heaven can watch at all of anything that is happening on earth. If they ever can peer into the darkness of what's on the opposite side of heaven to a place called hell, if they do, could they be watching us at this very moment? There's a passage in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Just write it down. You don't have to turn here. I'm just going to make a quick mention of it. There is a passage there. Yeah. Do I need to be worried? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not that. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now when I read that verse in the Bible by itself, it would tell me God's going to do a bit of a lobotomy on me, all right, and I'm going to forget everything about this whole world. This is a good reason why when we study Scripture, we don't take one verse, maybe out of context, and make a whole theology out of it. We've got to look at what does all of the Bible have to say. Here I suggest to you he's talking about the sinfulness of heaven and earth is going to be something that we will not remember anymore. But you could make an argument that says, eh, we're not going to know anything that goes on once we get there. However, I would like for you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. Let me uh, check some of your Bible knowledge. All right? Uh, not every chapter in the Bible has a title. But Hebrews, chapter 11, actually does have a title. What's, it, what's the title of Hebrews 11? The Hall of Fame of Faith. All right? And what it is, is God opened upon the heart of the writer of Hebrews, because he was writing to the Hebrews, to give them a snapshot of their history and highlight the heroes of faith out of the Old Testament. You see, it's good to remember the past. There are things to be learned from the past. And God wanted Israel to not forget their spiritual heritage. So let me just hit the highlights of Hebrews 11 quickly. Many people have memorized Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I would have loved to have quoted this verse to our raft guide going down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon when he was trying to explain geologically how all of these formations came into being. And then after he finished this very lengthy explanation, he said, however, we don't really know. I would have liked to say, yes, we do. 
God did it. That's what Hebrews 11, 2 says in 3. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God has taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. What a commendation. You please me. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons, worshipped as he leaned on top of the staff. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Verse 31, by faith the prostitute Rahab. She never was able to drop that handle, was she? Every time you read about Rahab, it is always the prostitute Rahab or Rahab the prostitute, even in the lineage of Jesus. Okay? All the good stuff that happened to her after she stopped being a prostitute. And you know why I think it's recorded that way? Because every single time we read that, it is a reminder of transformation and restoration and reconciliation. Your past can't be so bad that God will stop reaching out for you. Verse 32, And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon or Barak or Samson or Jephthah or David or Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gave what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle, routed four armies, women received back their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced years in flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death by the sword. They went around in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. And what was that? What is it that they and us share together? The finished work of Jesus Christ. They had faith in what Jesus was going to do. His life, His death, His crucifixion, His resurrection. Their faith was in what He was going to do. God now asks you and I to have faith in what He has already done. And together... We inherit eternal life. I read all that to get us to chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are we surrounded by? All these people that he's talked about. And more. Those that he didn't even mention by name. We are surrounded by them. It's kind of like they're at a banister cheering us on. He said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Somebody has once said that this is the lettuce garden of faith. Let us, let us, let us, let us. All right? Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider who, him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I have a couple of search engines on my computer that enables me to put in a subject or a scripture verse and I can scour hundreds of sermons looking for ideas. And over these past two weeks, I've looked at 300 passages, 300 sermons about Hebrews chapter 12. 
Every single one of those sermons all looked at Hebrews chapter 12 from Earth's perspective. Every single one of them was a challenge to persevere, to not lose heart, to continue on, to not slide backwards. Every single one of them was from Earth's perspective. Not a one of them dealt with the first sentence. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. You know, we talk a lot with our teenagers about peer pressure. I would suggest to you, God has got a form of peer pressure from the positive side laid out for us right here. There are those who have gone before you who are your cheerleaders from heaven for what we might be doing on earth. See, at first glance, this verse appears to imply that the occupants of heaven are like spectators of a track meet, sitting in the stands, watching people run the race of faith while on earth. Now, there's a part of that that's really exciting, isn't it? And then there's a part of that that's just a little bit creepy. Y'all know who Solomon is, right? Most of you know who Solomon is. Solomon is the son of David. He wrote a couple of the books in the Old Testament. Uh, what's his most famous book? Well, I can't say that. What's the most obvious book that Solomon wrote? Song of Solomon. What is that about? You can say it in church. It's about intimacy between a husband and his wife. i got to be honest, whenever the sermon was a little boring when I was a kid growing up, I would turn to read Song of Solomon during the sermon. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but there's something a little creepy. Thinking the guy who wrote Song of Solomon, the best book on intimacy that there is, check it out in our bedroom. That's a little frightening. Or how about my grandmother from heaven watching me try to cook in the kitchen on <laughs> earth? Can't compare. But I'm not sure that that's what they're looking for. You see, the evidence that we have here is they are concerned about the arena of faith. They're concerned about our spiritual life. So, when Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 teaches us about these witnesses, I think what he's teaching us is about the cheerleaders we have in our spiritual journey on earth. Furthermore, Paul described that there was a heavenly audience in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, when he described his own life as being a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We can assume from this verse that angels are aware of activities here on earth. But Scripture provides us with other examples of those in heaven who seem to know what is happening on earth. One of the classic passages found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. If you want to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 16, if you'll notice in your Bible, if you have red letters, chapter 16 is all red letters. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is not telling a parable in the middle of the chapter. He is telling a story. There is a difference between a parable and a story. A parable is the image of one thing reflected in the words of another. All right, It's making a connection so we understand. A story basically is to be true. Jesus in the middle of this message tells a story about two people. The rich man and Lazarus. I'm not going to take the time to read the passage, but I want you to find it so you can read it on your own. Let me reiterate very quickly. We have two characters. The rich man, what do we know about him? He's rich. Good. It was not a trick question. All right? The rich man is rich. All right? He has everything you can imagine in this world. Uh, what do we know about Lazarus? He's poor and he's sick. Okay? He's poor and he's sick. He's a beggar. He doesn't ask for much. In the story, and obviously the rich man and Lazarus know each other. And all Lazarus asks of the rich man is the crumbs that would fall off his table. He didn't ask for the steak on his plate. He didn't ask for anything out of the pantry. He said, could you just give me your discards? Your leftovers, your throwaways. 
And the rich man was self-centered and prideful and haughty. He said, no, you can't have anything after that. These two men died on the same day. It's very clear in the story. The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus goes to paradise. Paradise in the story is described as Abraham's bosom. Abraham is considered to be the father of faith. So here's what we have. Okay, we've got to get a picture here. This is, this is the Hadean world from the Old Testament. I'm going to give you a brief theology lesson. Okay? I actually wrote a term paper on this in Bible Commons. Best term paper I've ever written. It's the only one I remember. <laughs> it's the only one that had long-lasting value for me. All right? You see, in the Old Testament, when you died, you didn't go directly to heaven yet. Why? Because Jesus hasn't lived, been crucified, buried, and risen from the dead yet. The payment from our sin had not been made. It was only the sacrifice of, of, of sheep and goats that would roll away. It was, it was like paying the interest on the debt, but the debt wasn't paid. So until the debt was paid, they didn't go to heaven. But in what was known in the Old Testament as the Hadean world, okay, and, and you're, getting a, you're getting a short version of this, because this would be an hour lesson. All right, so we did the short version of this. The Hadean world had two, two compartments in it. One was a place of torment. One was a place of blessedness. Those who died by faith went to the place of blessedness. Those who died without faith went to the place of torment. This story that Jesus tells, he has not been crucified, died. The payment of sin had not been given yet, so he's given us the picture, a very clear picture of what it was like for all these Old Testament saints. And so, the rich man, who had everything he could want in life, had nothing that he wanted in eternity. Lazarus, the poor man, had nothing that he desired in life, but got everything he could desire for eternity. And the scripture says it this way, the rich man in pain and torment looked across the gulf. There was a barrier that he could see through. And he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham in a place of contentedness. And he said, Lazarus, could you just dip your fingers in a cup of water and sprinkle it on my tongue? What had Lazarus asked for the rich man through life? Just a crumb? off the table. He could afford to have done it, but he wouldn't. Now, in eternity, Lazarus says to the rich man, I wish I could, but there's a great gulf between the two, and I cannot cross it and do for you what you would like. Notice the difference. In life, the rich man could, but wouldn't. In eternity, Lazarus would, but he couldn't. Because there was this gulf fixed. So it gives us a view of eternity. Now, the rest of the story is, after Jesus finished his work, the Bible says, while the body of Jesus lay in the tomb, Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, that, that Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth. This Hadean world where there was this place of blessedness and this place of torment. And there he preached the message of condemnation to those who had rejected faith and the final message of blessedness to those who had died in faith, Abraham and Moses and Elijah. And the scripture says Jesus then led captivity captive. Those who had been held captive in this paradise now went with Jesus when he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. And that's why the Bible now says... Be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't go to sleep. We're not in a holding zone at any point in time, but we go directly to heaven. And that is our hope we die. And then the Bible goes on further to say that hell hath enlarged itself for all those who have chosen to go there. Well, since Jesus took all the Old Testament saints out of the place of blessedness in this old Hadean world, it's now vacated. So heaven now, or hell now, encompasses all of the Indian world referred to in the New Testament as the place of Gehenna, the place of fire and anguish. That is the story of Luke chapter 16. It tells us that there is this awareness from a heaven's perspective, not a earth's perspective, 
but of what's going on elsewhere. Then there is the tribulation of martyrs that's revealed to us in the book of Revelation. When John had his heavenly vision, he saw those, those believers who had lost their life because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They had surrounded God's throne and they cried for justice about those who had murdered them. Revelation 6, 9 and 10 says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the souls those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. They cried out with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, will you wait? to avenge the blood of those on earth. And then we have a different vision of John in the book of Revelation. In chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory belong to our God because His judgments are true and righteous. He has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and He has avenged the blood of His servants on her. Again, praise the believers in heaven for God's judgment against His enemies on earth. Jesus loved telling stories. And three of his most famous are found in Luke chapter 15, one chapter before the 16th chapter. And in that chapter, we find the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. All three of these stories share the same purpose, to contrast the attitude of self-righteous Pharisees who hated sinners with an attitude of a truly righteous God who loved sinners. Jesus points to all three parables was the same. When you lose something of value, whether it's a sheep, a coin, or a child, you don't curse the lost object. Instead, you search for it and you celebrate it once it's been found. And God has the same attitude about people who are living apart from Him. When a sinner is reunited with God through confession, the Bible says in Luke 15, 7, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. And there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I misunderstood that verse most of my life. I always thought it was the angels rejoicing. That's not what the verse says. It says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Who do you think is rejoicing? All those Hall of Fame of Faithers who were in heaven. My mama who's already in heaven. Your friend, your, your loved one who's already gone to heaven. They know how to rejoice because when they see on earth another one of their family come to know Jesus, they celebrate this exciting thing because they know what you get because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So if citizens of heaven rejoice at the salvation of sinners, then they not only know what is taking place on earth, at least in a general sense, but they're aware of some of the specific choices spiritually that are made on earth, whether people have accepted or rejected Christ. There's a website you can go to, and it says, Ask Billy Graham a question. And so I went there. And I found out that somebody had, years ago, sent into Billy Graham's website and asked him, Do people in heaven know what's going on on earth. You want to know what Billy said? I did. Here's what Billy said. Billy said, yes! Heaven is a place of happiness and peace and we can be confident that our loved ones who have gone on before us into heaven are not disturbed or upset over evil on earth. They see things from heaven's perspective, not earth's. The Bible doesn't clearly tell us if people in heaven are able to observe everything that happens, although there are hints that they probably do. In the book of Hebrews, for example, the writer recalls the great men and women who've gone on before us. And then he says, they surround us as a great cloud of encouragers, cheering us on as we seek to follow Christ. Never forget that heaven's main focus is Jesus. Thank God for the hope that we have in Christ, the hope that's based squarely on Him, what He did for us, now through us, and in us. I found out something interesting. This is one of those little God makes. It just happens. How could it be? Remember, I didn't preach this sermon last week because I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't happy with the way it was working out. You know what I found out? This morning, today, is the 10th anniversary of Greg Laurie. You all know, I told you who Greg Laurie was, right? This is the 10th anniversary of the death his 33-year-old son. His son was killed 10 years ago when his car ran into the back of a Caltrans truck on his way to be involved in leading worship at Harvest Festival Church. This, this day, this Sunday morning, in fact, at 9.01, 2 
between our services here is when that wreck occurred 10 years ago today. Greg Laurie said after that event, he said it changed my life. He said I've never studied more about heaven like I have the last four years. The other topic I invest a lot of time in now is hope. Heaven and hope. He said, you could say I'm a student on the Sunday to those two words. I'm not an expert, but man, I'm on the team. Christopher Laurie, that was his son's name. At 33 years of age, killed on a freeway in Corona, California. Christopher's mother was Laurie. Excuse me, it's Kathy. And she wrote on her husband's blog that she struggles to, struggles to explain her grief. She stated, on this day at 9.01 a.m., my first point son, Christopher, left this world and was ushered, as Elizabeth Elliot so beautifully put it in her book, my son was ushered through the gates of splendor. Lori preached that he's not the only one fascinated with the subject of the afterlife, but thousands of people are. Over 200,000 books have been written on the subject. But Lori said this, my belief is that everything I need to know about heaven is found in the pages of this book. Six years ago, Laurie's message on a Sunday morning was a continuation of a series that he was involved in, the book of Revelation. And he titled the sermon that day, What Do People in Heaven Know About What Is Going On Earth and Do They Care? Laurie had four key points, and let me just highlight them for you. Laurie said, I think people in heaven know a lot more about earth than we may realize. And he used several passages, in 15 and 16 a month before. His second point that he made that day was when people come to believe in Jesus Christ, it becomes public knowledge in heaven. Now, I don't know how it becomes public knowledge. I don't know if God sent out a massive email or a, a, a heaven-wide text where there's a big announcement that takes place. I, that part I don't understand, but there's enough evidence in Scripture, and we've looked at a few of those today, that certainly when a person becomes a Christian, it becomes public knowledge in heaven. His third point that he made is, the people that, is that people there know about the time and place of events on earth as an evidenced by the passages of Revelation and those that celebrated when justice was done. And then his last point that he made in that sermon on the anniversary of his son's death is there will be a connection between those in heaven and those on earth. Those in heaven will be aware of the spiritual status of their loved ones. And there is cheering taking place. You know there's two types of cheering, don't you? There's a kind of cheering that takes place like for the Wright's grandson. I gotta be honest, when Sean and I watch that, we we got messed up all the time. We thought it was gonna be on Wednesday evening, but it actually took place that Nationals 200 Butterfly, it actually took place on Tuesday evening. And so when Shelly and I found it, we, we found the results before we found the video. And so we turned the video on, we put it on our big screen at the house, and we watched the swim. He's losing after the first lap, he's losing after the second lap, he is in seventh place at the end of the third lap, and there's only four laps to swim. I forgot that he had won the race. I'm watching it, and I start, I start cheering for him just because I know his grandparents and I want him to do good, and so I start cheering at him, and there's no way in the world he's going to win this race, but I'm cheering because I like him. And then he, halfway through that lap, the announcer says, you got to keep your eye on that Justin Wright kid. He's a good finisher. And all of a sudden, about two more big, and he's running up there even. And those last two, half a length, touches the wall first. Chill's talking about it. How are people cheering for you? How, do you have loved ones in heaven right now that you know are there? I'm not talking about the hope so. I'm talking about that you know. You, you know I do quite a few funerals and I meet with a lot of families. It's a rarity. It's a rarity when somebody says, my dad's not in heaven. My spouse is in hell. Another family last week for a service this coming week. I'm another daughter of 40 years. She 
He said to him, I don't know what my mom is. All I have is hope. I don't know. I know where my dad went, I know my stepdad went, but I don't know about my mom. You know what makes me think of I said, well, mom never could pin it down. And I never saw evidence of this decision in her life. I don't know. But for those of you who know, what are they cheering for you? Are they cheering that you finish strong? Or are they cheering that you find Jesus? Are they yelling at you because they're encouraging you? Or are they yelling at you because they're afraid for you? Are they yelling, hey, keep growing! You're doing good! Or stop backsliding! You're doing so good! What are they cheering? Are they cheering, hey, whoa, way to be humble, kiddo! Or they say, hey, 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 you're too conceited! Humble yourself! Are, are they saying, yeah, hey, you're teaching Sunday school? Or are they saying, get off your pew butt! Do something! Engage! Did I just say butt out loud? <laughs> What are they cheering? If you don't know Jesus, they're cheering you to come to faith. If you know Jesus, they're cheering you to grow in your faith. I know what my mom is saying. I remember my mother's last words really to me of any value. It was the morning that she passed away, before she passed away. And I had to go do two funerals and I didn't want to leave her bedside. And I was crying. I don't want to go. And she looked at me and she said, we have more than enough faith that we need. You go give faith to those who don't have any. And every time I drive in and out of the Clovis Cemetery, I hear my mother say, oh boy, share faith again. Do it again. What are you hearing from the stands of heaven? Let's pray. Father, Thank you not only for the desires of your heart for us, but thank you for the desires of our loved ones, our friends and family, who, however this works, are cheering us in our spiritual journeys. Father, if we're not sure that we're going to heaven, this will be a great morning to make sure. I don't want, to, I don't want anybody to be like the rich man who could have, in this life, made sure but wouldn't. I'd much rather be poor in this life and be like Lazarus and be one who could and did. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. See you next Sunday.